Hello family, we thank the Lord for another day. We glorify his name for his mercy endures forever. Yesterday I did share that I will continue looking at the passage of scripture regarding the veil and the screen, which I'd read in Exodus chapter 26 yesterday. Uh, but in, for the purposes of this continuation, I will not be focusing on the fabrics of the veil, but I will be focusing on the holy place and the holy of holies. The first passage of scripture I want to read is Exodus 26 verse 33. It says, you shall hang the veil from the hooks that connect the curtains together, and you shall bring the ark of the testimony there within the veil. The veil shall separate for you the holy place and the holy of holies. How does the holy place and the holy of holies connect with Jesus? To answer that, I'm going to read the whole of Hebrews chapter 9. It says, now even the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and for the earthly sanctuary. A technical sacred tent was put up, the outer one of first section, in which were the lampstand and the table with its loaves of the sacred showbread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was another technical, the inner one or second section, known as the holy of holies, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered entirely with gold. This contained a golden jar which held the manna and the rod of Aaron that sprouted and the two stone tablets of the covenant inscribed with the Ten Commandments. And above the ark were the golden cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But we cannot now go into detail about these things. Now, when these things have been prepared in this way, the priests continually enter the altar or first section of the tabernacle, that is, the holy place, performing the ritual acts of the divine worship. But into the second inner tabernacle, the holy of holies, only the high priest enters, and then only once a year, and never without bringing a sacrifice of blood, which he offers as a substitutionary atonement for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. By this, the Holy Spirit signifies that the way into the holy place, the true holy of holies and the presence of God has not yet been disclosed as long as the first or outer tabernacle is still standing. That is, as long as the Levitical system of worship remains a recognized institution. For this first or outer tabernacle is a symbol that is an archetypal paradigm for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which are incapable of perfecting the conscience and renewing the inner self of the worshipper. For they, the gifts, sacrifices and ceremonies, deal only with clean and unclean, food and drink and various ritual washings, mere external regulations for the body, imposed to help the worshippers until the time of reformation, that is the time of the new order, when Christ will establish the reality of what these things foreshadow. A better covenant. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, that is true spiritual worship, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not a part of this material creation. He went once for all into the holy place, the holy of holies of heaven, into the presence of God, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood having obtained and secured eternal redemption, that is, the salvation of all who personally believe in him as Saviour. For if the sprinkling of ceremonially defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the cleansing of the body, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Holy Spirit willingly offered himself unblemished, that is, without moral or spiritual imperfection as a sacrifice to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works and lifeless observances to, the, to serve the ever-living God. For this reason, 
He is the mediator and negotiator of a new covenant that is an entirely new agreement uniting God and man so that those who have been called by God may receive the fulfillment of the promised eternal inheritance since a death has taken place as the payment which redeems them from the sins committed under the obsolete first covenant. For where there is a will and testament involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will and testament takes effect only at death, since it is never in force as long as the one who made it is alive. So even the first covenant was not put in force without the shedding of blood. For when every commandment in the law had been read by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of the calves and goats, which had been sacrificed together with water and scarlet wool and with a bunch of hyssop, and he sprinkled both the scroll itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that seals and ratifies the agreement which God ordained and commanded me to deliver to you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the containers and sacred utensils of worship with the blood. In fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, neither release from sin and its guilt, nor cancellation of the merited punishment. Therefore, it was necessary for the earthly copies of the heavenly things to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves required far better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one. But he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the very presence of God on our behalf. Nor did he enter into the heavenly sanctuary to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer over and over since the foundation of the world. But now once for all, at the consummation of the ages, he has appeared and been publicly manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed and destined for all men to die once and after this comes certain judgment, so Christ, having been offered once and once for all to bear as a burden the sins of many, will appear a second time when he returns to earth, not to deal with sin but to bring salvation to those who are eagerly and confidently waiting for him. So we see from this passage of scripture, not only was the veil pointing to Jesus and all that he was going to do to bridge the gap that sin had caused there to be because Adam and Eve sinned against God. But Jesus offered himself. He also, as we've read, became our mediator and negotiator, offering up himself, offering up his perfect blood for you and I. And what is beautiful about what Jesus did, did is that when Jesus died, something significant happened. And so I'm reading Matthew 27 from verse 50 to verse 54. It says this, And Jesus cried out again with a loud, agonized voice and gave up his spirit, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. And at once the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised to life and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection. They entered the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe. And said, truly, this was the Son of God. Affirming that what we've read in Hebrews chapter 9, that Jesus entered the mighty presence of God, not here on earth, but in heaven, 
offered his blood, affirming that he had paid the penalty for our sin and had been accepted by God, the Bible says that the veil that was in the temple was immediately torn, split from top to bottom, symbolizing what had spiritually taken place by Jesus giving up his ghost, that that separation had been quashed because of what Jesus did. It is the reason why you and I, we do not need to go and offer up sacrifices, kill goats and, 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 and calves and you name it, so that we will offer up their blood. There's no high priest who needs to go into the Holy of Holies anywhere to make atonement for your sin and for my sin, because Jesus did it. But what is beautiful, which Hebrews 9 affirms is that he did it for all who would believe in him once and for all. He didn't have to keep repeating this sacrificial act. He did it once and for all. And by faith in Christ, you and I have access. For the Bible makes us understand we go boldly before the throne room of grace. Wherever we, we find ourselves, whether it be in a gathering of believers, whether it be in our church gatherings, whatever, we can experience the mighty presence of God. Because there's no, no longer any veil separating us from God. It is the reason why 24-7 we can call upon the name of God. And this is the reason why. I also want to encourage us that let us not take for granted what Jesus has done. Because the Bible makes us even understand that when Jesus died, something beautiful also occurred. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture in Mark 16:19. It says, So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. That is so profound to me because it's interesting that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, affirming that what he did on the cross so pleased the Father that he was given a place to sit as our high priest. For I have not read anywhere that it makes me understand or indicates that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, that he sat. And even if he, as we know, he went in and it was just once a year and he would have to leave. But Jesus, our mediator, Jesus, the one in whom this new covenant that you and I have is, is in, and who holds it all together, is seated at the right hand of God. And what is also beautiful about it is that the Bible says that because he is sitting, you and I can also sit. Think about it, that when we go into our church gatherings or whether you're in your home, and, you know, sometimes we, 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 we in fact, most times we go into church expecting that we would sit. We expect that we'll be comfortable. Sometimes, you know, we, we may experience the presence of God or what we feel is something that is attesting to the fact that there's a holy presence in our midst and we're seated comfortably. The high priest could not do that in the presence of God. But you and I have the ability to do that because of what Jesus did on the cross. And this is why it's so important that we get to the place where, you know, when sometimes in our worship, if we have to prostrate before God, that we take every opportunity to do so. When we are asked to lift up our hands or we feel that we want to lift up our hands to acknowledge our surrender to God and our worship of him, let us do so. If we have to kneel before almighty God, let us do so. Because if we were back in the era of the tabernacle, we will not even have access to the presence of God, let alone have the opportunity to sit comfortably and relax like we do. Now, let us not take the presence of God lightly. That we, you know, all of this that we have experienced and will continue to experience the presence of Almighty God, access to Almighty God 24-7 is because of what Jesus has done. 